Hi everyone, I'm John and I'll be presenting our work on deriving efficient program transformations from rewrite rules. Compilers are very difficult to write without bugs, so lately people have taken to writing compilers along with mechanized proofs of their correctness. This is very effective at squashing bugs, but mechanized proofs can be extremely tedious to do. We've been building a verified compiler called Certicoc, which goes from Galena, the core language of the Coq Proof Assistant, to a subset of C. Certicoc's backend has a number of optimization passes, each of which must be proved correct, and these proofs can take up a lot of our time. For example, this uncurrying pass is implemented in 300 lines of pretty straightforward Coq code, and then took me the better part of a semester and 2,000 lines of Coq tactics to prove correct. As another example, this shrink reduction pass was first invented and used in 1997, but wasn't proved correct, not even on paper, until 2016. So, it's natural to wonder whether automation can help make it easier to write these kinds of verified program transformations. While building Certicoc, we noticed that a lot of proofs about program transformations seem to have the same two-layered structure. First, a functional program implementing the transformation is proved sound with respect to some relational specification, usually given in the form of syntactic rewrite rules. Then, this relational spec is proved sound with respect to the semantics of the object language. This way of structuring the proof cleanly separates the task of proving a program transformation correct into one part that can just think about the semantics of the object language, and one part that can just think about the various data structures and invariants that need to be maintained by the implementation. Prior work has focused mostly on building tools which can take in relational specifications, automatically check that they are semantically sound, and then automatically generate reasonably efficient implementations. But these tools usually don't give the user control over low-level details that are important for efficiency, such as exactly what kinds of helper data structures should be used to store and compute data flow facts. In this work, we try and bring some of this control back to the user. We do this by building a tool which takes in not only a relational specification in the form of a set of rewrite rules, but also descriptions of exactly which kinds of helper data structures the user would like to use to execute those rules in an efficient way. Our tool generates from these descriptions large parts of a functional program and its correctness proof, leaving behind holes for the user to fill in manually with code that explains how each of their selected helper data structures ought to be manipulated. This generated partial program is given a rich dependent type, which ensures that once all holes are filled with well-typed terms, the program that you get out is guaranteed to be correct with respect to the specified rewriting relation. In order to build this tool, we had to figure out how to formally specify the various kinds of helper data structures often used by compiler writers in their implementations. And what we found is that a lot of these data structures maintain invariants of a very specific form, which I'll illustrate now with a concrete example. Consider the following toy object language, containing let bindings and an if-then-else construct that scrutinizes variables. And suppose we're writing an optimizer that can perform these two transformations, a case folding transformation that folds if-then-else expressions down to the proper branch if we know that the variable being scrutinized is bound to a Boolean literal, and a dead variable elimination transformation that removes let bindings for unused variables. Each of these transformations requires its own custom helper data structure in order to be implemented efficiently. In the case of case folding, we can pass around an extra parameter, which we call env, that maps variable names in scope to the Boolean literals that they're bound to. When we encounter a let binding for a variable to a Boolean literal, we can extend env accordingly before making a recursive call. Then, when we encounter an if-then-else that scrutinizes a variable x, we can look up x in the environment to check if it's bound to a Boolean literal. And if it is, we can perform case folding. To implement dead variable elimination, we can maintain a piece of state which maps variable names to the number of times that variable is used in the expression being transformed. Then when we hit a let binding, binding a variable x, we can check if that variable is dead by checking if it has zero uses. Here's an example which illustrates how these implementation strategies can be used to optimize the term shown on the left. To start, the environment is empty and uses maps each variable that occurs in the term to the number of times it's used. In this case, there are seven variables, x, y, z, a, b, c, and d, and each is used once. The first thing we encounter is a let binding from y to true. 
So we add this binding to the environment and make a recursive call. At the recursive call, we encounter a lap binding for z, which we can then add to the environment and make a recursive call on the if then else. Now we look up x in the environment to see if we can perform case folding. In this case, x is not in the environment, and so we can't perform case folding, and instead just make recursive calls on each of the branches. In the recursive call on the then branch, we encounter an if then else scrutinizing y. When we look up y in the environment, we find that it's bound to true, which means that we can fold this entire if then else down to its then branch. In doing so, we'll be deleting occurrences of variables b and y, and so their use counts will have to be decremented from 1 to 0. Something similar occurs in the recursive call on the else branch. We encounter an if then else scrutinizing z, and when we look up z in the environment, we find that it's bound to false. So we can perform case folding, replacing this if then else by its else branch d. In doing so, we'll be deleting occurrences of variables z and c, and so we have to decrement their use counts. Now, after decrementing various use counts, certain variables are dead, and we will discover this as we return from recursive calls on the way back up. Notice that at each step in this example, there was a subterm in focus, which I rendered in black font, and a surrounding context, which I rendered in gray. We can think of an implementation of a program transformation as a state machine with configurations of this form, consisting of pairs containing surrounding contexts and subterms in focus. From this perspective, data structures like env and uses maintain invariants which relate their values to these machine configurations at each step. For example, the invariant on env is that every key value pair xb corresponds to the variable name x being bound to Boolean literal b in the surrounding context c, and the invariant on uses is that every key value pair xn corresponds to the variable x being used n times in c applied to e, that is, the entire term being optimized. So going back to this picture from earlier, we now have our answer to this question of how to specify the invariants held by data structures that compiler writers like to use. And our answer is that a lot of these data structures maintain invariants that relate their values to pairs consisting of a one whole context and a subterm in focus. In addition to this notion of helper data structures, our tool also supports a restricted kind of delayed computation and the ability to specify custom termination metrics. The resulting framework is simple, but capable of expressing many of Certicoc's backend passes. Here in green, I've highlighted the passes that we've implemented using our tool, in blue, the passes that we believe could be implemented, and in red, the one pass, closure conversion, which we believe is not expressible, mainly because it's rather tricky to figure out how to express closure conversion as a rewrite rule. Now, to give a sense for what it's like to use our tool, I went ahead and implemented the example that I described on the previous slides in Coq. So to use our tool to write a proof correct program transformation, the user first has to define the syntax of the terms of their object language. This can be done in the normal way by encoding the syntax in a Coq inductive type, which I've chosen to call exp. Then the user runs a metaprogram, which we've written using Metacoq, a metaprogramming library for Coq, and this metaprogram parses their inductive definition and automatically generates a type of one-whole contexts for terms of their object language. Using these definitions, the user can then define the rewrite rules that they would like to implement, again in the usual way, by defining a Coq inductive relation. In this case, I've chosen to call this relation rewrite step, and each constructor of rewrite step corresponds to a rewrite rule that I would like to implement. Next, the user defines the helper data structures that they would like to use along with their invariants. Here, there are two helper data structures, an env map mapping variable names to Boolean literals with the invariant that every key value pair corresponds to a known let binding in the context, and a uses map mapping variable names to natural numbers with the invariant that getting a use count from the uses map gives back the number of times that variable is used in the expression being optimized. In order to actually use these helper data structures, our tool demands that the user prove the following three theorems, which basically explain to the tool how the invariants on the user's helper data structures can be maintained at each recursive call. In this case, here is what the proofs of these three theorems look like. 
Now, skipping over about 200 lines of boring proofs about use counts, we're finally ready to start deriving a proof correct implementation. The user begins by declaring a value, in this case called optimize, with the type of proved correct rewriters. This type is parameterized by various pieces of the specifications presented on the previous slides. The user invokes our tool by using the tactic makeRW. This tactic parses the specifications given in the types and generates large parts of a functional program and its correctness proof. The tactic leaves behind a number of proof obligations, each corresponding to a hole that must be filled in by hand. In this case, there are eight proof obligations, six of which correspond to proving things about termination and to de delayed computations, which we don't use. So these obligations can be easily solved by a couple lines of cock tactics shown here. After running these tactics, what remain are the following two proof obligations. This first proof obligation is basically the tool's way of asking the user to explain how to implement the case folding transformation using the helper data structures that they specified. This hole is given a fancy dependent type, which prevents the user from filling it with an incorrect implementation. Similarly, the second goal is the tool's way of asking the user to explain how to implement dead variable elimination. And again, the type prevent the user from making a mistake. In each case, the user fills the hole by using tactics, which generate cock code to implement the corresponding rewrite rule, and then prove that code correct. Here's what the tactic looks like for implementing and proving case folding correct. And here's the tactic for implementing and proving correct dead variable elimination. After running these tactics, zero proof obligations remain, and the user obtains an implementation of the desired program transformation, proved correct with respect to a set of syntactic rewrite rules in Cock. To evaluate our tool, we compared the number of lines of code and proof it took to implement the transformations highlighted in green using our tool compared to doing it all by hand. Then, we measured the runtimes of some of these generated implementations on a suite of benchmarks, and once again compared to handwritten counterparts. Here are the line counts. In blue are the amount of lines of code and proof it took to do everything by hand, and in red are the amount of lines of code and proof it took using our tool. As you can see, our tool in some cases significantly reduces the amount of manual proof effort required. Here are the runtimes, which basically show that our generated implementations are about as fast as their handwritten counterparts. Quick disclaimer here, there are a lot of details that I'm not going into in this comparison, and if you're curious about those details, please feel free to check out the relevant section of the paper. So what's next? Currently, our tool generates very dependently typed cock recursive functions written in a kind of continuation passing style to make sure that the generated code will be extracted to efficient OCaml. This is great for efficiency, but makes it very difficult to reason about the code that our tool generates inside Cock. So in future versions of our tool, we would like to make sure that the generated Cock code is more human readable. We would also like to investigate whether it would be possible to use our tool to write cross language transformations, such as CPS, ANF, and closure conversion, and we would like to try implementing more of the transformations in Certicox backend using our tool. Thanks for watching.